you for joining everybody. Very grateful to you for making time. Some of you are new, uh, and I'll just briefly say this is two-way, a platform intended to be uh, different than other platforms. Two-way allows everybody to ask questions. It's also longer. I like to think our conversations are more sophisticated than available other places. And we believe in civil discourse. There are Republicans and Democrats on this call. There's some Republicans and Democrats on this call who aren't going to like each other necessarily. But here we get along and we act civilly. That's part of the, the essence of this platform. I'll talk more about two-way at the end just because there are going to be more new people joining. But I am grateful to you for being part of it. I've got a lot of reporting that I'm going to start with. And then there are some folks I'm going to call on who, who um, I know are, are here or will be here. And again, your questions. If you've got to have a question, please raise your hand. I'll ask you to unmute and uh, you can ask a question, make a comment, whatever you wish. The three big questions that we're tracking related to President Biden, will he give up the nomination? Will he give up the presidency? And if he's not the nominee, is it Kamala Harris or someone else? I don't know the answers to any of those at this time. And there's subsidiary questions to the first question. What could cause him to, to, to change his mind? Um, what the timing is, all of that. We'll get into all of that. But I don't know the answer. And my sources, as was true yesterday, are highly mixed. I have very smart Republicans and Democrats saying there's no way Joe Biden will be the nominee. I have one saying he will. Same on the other questions. Some saying he can't possibly keep the presidency. Some saying he will. And, and some saying Kamala Harris will be the nominee and some saying she won't. So let me run through on the first thing. Dan Balls' new column, a bunch of Sunday columns are up already from the Times and the Post. Dan Balls' Sunday column, uh, he, he frames it as defiance versus delusion. And that's a pretty good way to frame it because the president is and his family are still very defiant. They have no intention of changing course. They're doing everything uh, in a way that is intended to keep the nomination, keep the presidency, and win the election. And increasingly, people are calling him deluded not just privately, but starting to be publicly. I still anticipate a pretty big moment tomorrow night when Hakeem Jeffries does a call with his leadership, and then Monday when Congress is back in town. I think of the trajectory we're on by then, and I think it's almost certain that there'll be an explosion in one form or another of calls on him to step down at a minimum from the nomination. Angie Craig, today Congresswoman from Minnesota, became the first House member from a battleground in a battleground district and potentially in a battleground state now to say the president should not be the nominee. That's a big deal. The New York Times has a story that basically has quotes almost no one on the record, but matches to some extent my reporting from yesterday that the expectation is that it's untenable that Joe Biden can go forward, that eventually he'll see that from, and that's an expectation from both Capitol Hill, the senior most levels in the Democratic Party as well as at the White House. I want to read you two paragraphs from their story. I think I know who their source is because I think it's one of my sources from yesterday. One senior White House official who has worked with Mr. Biden during his presidency, vice presidency and 2020 campaign, said in an interview Saturday morning that Mr. Biden should not seek re-election. Again, this is a senior White House official who worked with Joe Biden in the previous, in the Obama years and now. After watching Mr. Biden in private and public and while traveling with him, the official said they no longer believed the president had what it took to campaign in a vigorous way and defeat Donald Trump. The official who assisted on anonymity said Mr. Biden had steadily showed more signs of his age in recent months, including speaking more slowly, haltingly and quietly, as well as appearing more fatigued in private. There's going to be a lot more of this, and it's going to come from people who uh, some of whom I think will go to the president before they go public and give him the opportunity to change his mind. Watch that closely. Maureen Dowd's column says, again, you know, disappointed in her friend Joe Biden. That's going to sting the president, but it's not going to force him to quit. Ross Stafford has a column that says, well, Trump survived in 16. Biden's probably looking at that, and that's true that he is. Why can't Biden survive? Ross has three reasons why he thinks the Trump case is different, and they're very well reasoned and sophisticated. But I'll say again, if Joe Biden doesn't want to quit, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. These are, again, more of the reasons why we're leaning towards out today. David Axelrod has a new column on CNN.com. Uh, Axelrod Unbound, no longer worried about being called bad names by the president, basically says he's a deluded old man who should get out of the race. That's my paraphrase. Some of you will be familiar with this story, which is going to have huge legs of the people who want to say this is a Potemkin presidency in the Democratic Party. 
the two radio hosts who the president did interviews with, one from Pennsylvania, one from um, Wisconsin. He did the interviews on the third. They aired on the fourth. The two hosts appeared on CNN today and they and they acknowledged that the White House or the campaign rather wrote their questions for them. The campaign sent them eight questions and they chose they chose roughly the same question. CNN was smart enough to notice the questions were roughly the same. The hosts were insufficiently embarrassed uh, to have taken their questions from the White House, but or from the campaign rather. But that's going to already on Twitter and, and elsewhere. You're hearing a lot of Democrats, Republicans are, are giddy about it, but you're hearing a lot of Democrats say this is a joke because the president didn't answer the questions that well. He knew that he knew the questions they were going to ask and he didn't answer them that well. OK, there are two lines that Republicans are going to press very hard on in the coming days that are going to be a real problem for the, the campaign in the White House. Republicans in investigating Joe Biden during his presidency have been a clown show. They haven't done it well. And in part, they haven't done it well because like with the Hunter Biden investigations, the press was against them. The press didn't want to help them. Now the press is interested in these two stories, too. So the incompetent Republican Party on Capitol Hill in terms of investigations is now going to have a, a wind at their back because they'll be working with reporters. One is, what did the president's people know and when did they know it about his condition? As most of you know, I've been writing about this for quite some time. It's been a conspiracy. The press has been in on it or allowed themselves to be intimidated. There are people at the White House claiming to me they had no idea. I'm being charitable and extending them the presumption of grace and saying maybe they weren't in on it, but they do have TV. And uh, they, they should have at least had some suspicions about what was going on with the president. Um, and the vice president will take a lot of questions about this, regardless of where she, whether she ends up being the nominee. She's going to be part of this question of what did people know? How did they handle it? I tweeted a question, which is, given the president's condition, I hope his family had him diagnosed a while ago. There's a report that, that I wouldn't put out in public, but you can read it on social media and the New York Post that some expert on Alzheimer's has allegedly been in the White House many times and yeah. met with the president's doctor. May or may not be true. But again, there's two possibilities. One is he's been undiagnosed and the other is he's been, and, and, and they've engaged in a cover-up or he's been diagnosed and they've engaged in a cover-up. Uh, logic to me says it's the second one. But again, that's going to be greatly pursued. The other issue that's going to be pursued is whether he can remain as president. And Republicans are going to be very aggressive about that saying that he can't possibly be president, whether he steps down for the nomination or not. And again, the White House press corps now will, I think, ask the White House and the president that every day about whether or not he'll stay in. All right. Those are the main reasons why I would say today, and where we are right now, the president is veering towards getting out. What's on the other side? Well, he doesn't want to get out, and he has no intention to get out, and his family is, is not, uh, is, is not abandoned him at all. So that's pretty big. And I continue to believe that, that the only thing that could get him out, except maybe an absolute collapse in fundraising, is Hakeem Jeffries and, and Chuck Schumer telling him he must get out. And we've seen that uh, most prominently with President Nixon. Didn't work with Bill Clinton, though. Didn't work with Bill Clinton when congressional leaders said, you got to get out. So that doesn't mean that that will work. And I, I can't tell you anything else that I would say with any confidence would definitely work. Paragraph from the same New York Times story which is largely a negative story for the president with lots of blind quotes from people basically saying, if he doesn't get out next week, I'll be going public. Some of Mr. Biden's advisors have suggested that the focus on the president's age and debate performance is only of interest to donors, the news media and pundits. Anyone here who's gotten gas or gone to a deli or talked to their cousins this week knows that that's not true, but that's what they're saying. They said the campaign's small dollar fundraising remains strong. Very important if true and noted that many Democratic elected officials had publicly stressed their support for Mr. Biden and continued to campaign for him. That's true. The biggest thing for the president today is the Bloomberg poll. Bloomberg battleground state polls show the race close. Now, it's still disaster for President Biden. He's behind in five of the seven battleground states. It's not a winning hand, but he's closer in those numbers. He's down two in the aggregate. It's not my favorite poll, but it's a decent poll. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that 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 will stiffen the president's spine to say, why should I get out? My polls haven't collapsed. In fact, I'm closer than I've ever been in one of the few in one of the few places that actually polls the battleground states. 
If you haven't looked at the poll, I recommend it to you. There's some wacky numbers in there. He's doing better in Georgia than in Pennsylvania, et cetera. But, but leaving aside whether the poll's accurate, whether there'll be other battleground, battleground state polls that show that, that is a big thing for the White House. And I, 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 know, I know the president's aware of the poll. He's doing a lot of fundraising appeals. I, I, I'm on that list. I get them. They're becoming increasingly populist, attacking the media, attacking the pundits. If they're right that they're raising money off that, that's a good sign for the president. I'm not sure that's true, but that's something uh, to take a look at. And then they scrambled his schedule for tomorrow. He was supposed to speak at a union event in Philadelphia and there are picket lines that he doesn't want to cross. So they've added a different event in Philadelphia, TBD, as far as I know, at this hour. And they've also added a um, event in Harrisburg. So that's two events on a Sunday, not hanging out in Delaware, Pennsylvania, but still be interesting to see what those events are like. Now, people speculate a lot about will he step down, who the vice president, if the vice president or someone else would be the nominee. As far as I know, Joe Biden is not engaged in those conversations because he doesn't intend to step down. So I think on the second question of whether he'll step down, I don't have any idea. My gut continues to be that particularly if Kamala Harris is the nominee, it'd be very difficult for, to expect her to run for president and be president. So I, I still think he'll stay if he can, but I do believe the pressure will be pretty firm. On the question of who the vice president, if the vice president or someone else would be the nominee, I've changed my perception of that. Uh, yesterday when we met, I, I was very bullish on her being the nominee. I thought that was it was a very small chance it would be someone else. That's changed uh, today. I still think she's the odds on favorite, and I don't see anybody challenging her necessarily. But doubts are growing, and there are a lot of people, including a lot of donors and a lot of electeds who I've spoken to, who say, we're crazy, we're a suicidal party if we trade out a guy who we don't think can win for a woman we don't think can win. And, 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 and you know, there may be, she's got fans and, and the delegates are Biden-Harris delegates, but how crazy are we, people are saying to me, to do this, okay? Um, Newt Gingrich uh, did a tweet about basically saying how delighted he'd be to run against <laughs> Kamala Harris. Going to call on the speaker. I think he's here to talk about that in a minute. Um, we heard from Phil Singer yesterday uh, here. He needs to not nominate her. And Andrew Sullivan has a column uh, saying, basically sounding like Newt Gingrich on that question. Where's Barack Obama? Where's Nancy Pelosi? I think you got to continue to track what their points of view on this is. I think they'll be extraordinary. Be oh, Last okay. thing I want to say is about Donald Trump. Okay, Hi. Uh, He has a truth social tweet that's uh, just mocking of President Biden, mocking of Kamala Harris. He has some choices and his team has some choices to make. The convention's coming up. The president, Biden's press conference is supposed to be on Thursday. So when is the nominee, the vice, Trump's vice presidential nominee going to be named? That's a big decision for him. If you think Biden is still in the race by Thursday, that's a choice he makes. And, um, and then the other thing is obviously their convention. And I'm hearing all sorts of things from Democrats about, well, Biden should get out during the Republican convention to step on the convention. I don't think we're in a world yet where, where anything's that neat when it, when it comes to Biden world and, and how they're going to sequence things. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how all this plays out. It's a very fluid situation, to say the least. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to ask Speaker Gingrich to talk about his overall view of, of whether Joe Biden can hang on and sort of the, the, the executive versus the legislative branch dynamic, and then about Kamala Harris and anything else on his mind, and then and then uh, we'll call on some other folks. So, Speaker Gingrich, if you could unmute, uh, again, I think I re-muted you, uh, and tell us your overall view, uh, and, then, well, and then I'd love to hear from you on the question of whether you think congressional leaders can get him out, and then Kamala Harris. Go ahead. Well, let me say, first, first of all, I'm glad you're doing this, and I think it's very helpful. Uh, I think your analogy with Nixon is wrong. Uh, when the Republican leaders went to see Nixon, they said to him unequivocally, if you do not step down, we will all impeach you. So there was a matter of force. Uh, unless the Democratic leadership is prepared to say, we will impose the 25th Amendment, they have no muscle. They have opinions, uh, they have prestige, but they have no operating mechanism comparable to 1974. Uh, second, 
I'm think... sorry, let me, let, me, let, me, let me stop you there and just say, I think what the mechanism they'd have was the threat to go public and appeal to him, not, a, not there's, it's no force, but to appeal to him to say, the caucuses will denounce you and, and, and to believe that Joe Biden wouldn't, wouldn't want that. I know it's not. I know it's not the same as impeachment. That's right. It's that's about. If you if you looked at a guy who said to Stephanopoulos, "If God Almighty comes and tells me," um, it's a big jump from there. Whatever Schumer may think of himself, to think that he and Hakeem are God Almighty. So my only point is, they may have an influence. You may be right. It may be that Joe and 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 more importantly, I mean that Joe and Hunter. Uh, decide that that's right. Or it may be that in the Woodrow Wilson tradition, the three of them just say, we understand that you're weak, cowardly politicians worried about election, but we stand for history and we're not doing that. We're not doing it, period. Yeah. So I, th I think the potential for Biden to survive by brute determination is greater than people think, unless it gets bad enough that there's a credible belief that they would apply the 25th Amendment. Uh, second, <clears throat> what I'm surprised by, and this may be because I'm a Republican and I don't fully understand the dynamics of the Democratic Party, Kamala's not an advantage over Biden. I mean, the fact is, from a Republican perspective, looking at polling data, looking at her record, I mean, give me the person named the czar for the border that is going to have to tr try to defend millions of illegal immigrants that she theoretically was responsible for stopping and give me the next 10 or 12 ideas uh, that she's been involved in. She's more radical than Joe Biden. Uh, she's more unlikable than Joe Biden. Uh, and uh, there's no evidence in polling data that she's an advantage. I mean, if, if the Democrats were truly desperate and wanted to win above everything, they would have an open convention uh, and they would find some way to get to a governor who was electable. Um, I don't think they can do that. I don't think it's practical. But I, I think that uh, the idea that somehow Kamala will do dramatically better, I, my guess is she'll do dramatically worse. Uh, and she will turn sort of a Mondale-like collapse by Biden into a McGovern-like collapse uh, by the time her candidacy is done. That's, that's, again, just my view, although I'm writing about it tomorrow. Uh, but uh, I, I'm glad to have a chance to share it. Do you, do you, thank you for all that, do you find any of the other Democrats, any of the governors, for instance, to be formidable to the extent that you'd say, wow, if they, if they found their way to nominating that person, it would shake up the race in a positive way for the Democrats? I think that Shapiro and Bashir are probably the two most effective. I think that uh, Whitmer would be effective. The, those three, if, if I'm sitting as a Republican strategist worrying about a world that's much worse than the one we're in, those are the three names that would come to mind. But all of them have this problem that the first thing they have to be asked is, when did you know that Biden was incompetent and why didn't he say anything? The second thing they have to, they're going to be asked is, is there any major Biden program you disagree with? Uh, because the fact is, which nobody on the left wants to admit, Biden's problems in large part are programmatic, not personal. Uh, his policies are largely unpopular. We, as you know, I do a project called the America's New Majority Project, which is available online. All of our data is public. Uh, on issue after issue, I mean, parental cho parents' rights to know, for example, is like an 84% issue. The teachers' union opposes it. And I could give you 10 other examples where the left has just left the American people. And almost any Democratic candidate has to somehow be in the framework of a, what is an unpopular agenda despite the belief in the left that it's actually what the American people want. There are some Biden positions that are more popular. Tax, sure. tax increases on the wealthy, <clears throat> protecting entitlements, uh, the infrastructure bill. So it's not, it, it's possible that a Democrat <laughs> could, could run right. on it's those not, things, right? It, it's, it's, no, but as, as you run campaigns, our side's not gonna men mention the three you mentioned. Our side's gonna say, where are you in the following nine or 10 or 12 things? And on most of those, and Kamala's on almost every case, worse than Biden. She's more, she's instinctively more radical. She's younger, she's California, not Delaware. Uh, so I, I think from our standpoint, uh, we, we probably do better against Kamala than against Biden, unless Biden just totally collapses and becomes unacceptable. 
Uh, but in either case, there's, there's no, I don't see any easy way to get past one of those two. I mean, the idea that you're going to get to a third person could happen. This is, we're, we're entering a period here we've never been in before. So I, I don't say it's impossible, but uh, it's, it's pretty hard to imagine how they dump both Biden and Harris and get to a third candidate. Last question for you, Mr. Speaker. And again, love for you to stick around and chime in as you wish. Where do you think the President Trump is on a selection of a running mate? Which names do you think are you still taking seriously? Um, I suspect in the back of his head, he already has chosen somebody. But I also suspect that he reserves the right to himself to change whatever he's already decided. And I think that he's loving where he's at right now. I mean, I think the very fact that you can go for a week with Trump saying almost nothing uh, and that he's willing, he's cheerfully giving up page one uh, to his opponent tells you how much trouble Biden's in. And I suspect, I mean, my guess is that Trump will probably try to counter pick, but I don't know, I, I know nothing about this. I haven't talked to him about it in a serious way. I, my, my instinct is they'll wake up one morning, he'll have a good shot, he'll suddenly say, yep, that's the right person. It'll feel right to him and he'll pick that person. Uh, and, uh, you know, I suspect they'll be very formidable in their rollout and that they will be, a, there'll be a remarkable contrast of stability and rationality compared to what is an increasingly chaotic Democratic Party. If it's between the three people most often mentioned, Rubio, Ber <laughs> Bergam, Rubio, Bergam, and, and uh, um, Vance, who would you recommend? Well, I'd also throw in Youngkin. Yeah, I think I, th I think that uh, my I have no. First of all, if I had a real recommendation, it wouldn't be to you. Uh, but my observation, as opposed to recommendation, would be that whoever communicates stability is an enormous advantage in a moment of absolute chaos as seen by the country. Okay, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Stay with us. If you would, Mark McKinnon, yeah. I'd love for you to unmute. Thank you for all that. I'd love for you to unmute Mark McKinnon because I want to ask you some questions if you would. Yes, sir. <laughs> all right, thank you for joining. Mark, I, 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 you've spent a lot of time with, with politicians in, in dire straits. If Joe Biden said, Mark, tell me my, your most optimistic case for my chances of being reelected, what case would you make to him? I, well, I, you know what I would do, Mark? I would, this is a situation where somebody has to go into the propellers and I say, Karen Hughes, you go. <laughs> huh. You tell him, because she would. Uh, you what's, know, the the thing that I, what's the optimistic case, though? If he says, Mark, I, I, I know you've got doubts about me, but how can I save this? What, what, what could he do at this point to save it? I, I think realistically, Mark, uh, the only thing that he can do would be to, to stay the course and just hope that something, uh, you know, unforeseen happens to Trump. I mean, that on, on any sort of glide path, barring some, you know, uh, unforeseen catastrophic event that happens to Trump, I think Trump loses. I think Biden loses. And the thing that strikes me as just a campaign operative is tr is anticipating and trying to envision what the campaign looks like now after all of this. I mean, you've alluded to it in certain, uh, you know, in a number of points, Mark. But the 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 sort of scrutiny that he was getting Your before preference. the debate, like if if it meant, so, you know, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Need to, Mark, hold on, we need to unmute you again. I the sort of scrutiny, Mark, that that he was getting before. The debate, which was just sort of general but not specific to all the things that we're talking about, is going to be so intense now that I mean, we know that the debate performance was not a one off and that there's going to be bad nights or bad days between now and the election. Even if he wasn't 81, there would be. But he is. So there's going to be a bunch of them. And it's just going to be a nuclear meltdown. And and every single it's just going to be the most uh, the most uninspiring slogging uh sort of lemming off the cliffs campaign that I I can recall ever it's going to be miserable for everybody involved I think the, I think the people around Biden are already miserable and to have to campaign now knowing what everybody knows I don't think we've ever seen anything like it and it's just every day is just going to be there, there will be no good days yeah 
Mark, last question. You, you, right after the debate said, basically, you can't imagine anyone voting for Joe Biden at this point. That doesn't mean you think people should vote for Donald Trump, but you thought he, he disqualified himself. Did anything in the ABC interview rehabilitate him for you at all? No, not at all. Uh, and, and I think that, I, I mean, I'll just say one thing. I mean, to say that he, I mean, first of all, to not have watched the debate as Al Gore did, not only watch, you know, as you know, Al Gore watched the debate and he watched the SNL mockery of the debate. But to, to A, to not go back and watch it, I think is is malpractice. But to say that he, as, as I think I'm accurate in this, Mark, he said he couldn't remember if he went back and watched it, which again is just, it's just more fodder for either his prevarication or his decline. Yeah. Um, Mark, thank you. Stay with us, please. Yeah. Come chime back in. Andrew Essex, I'm wondering if I can bring you in. I, I want to ask you about messaging. Uh, I, I ask you to unmute and turn your camera on if you will, Andrew. Maybe you won't. There we sure, go. Mark. Andrew Essex is a genius at messaging and storytelling. So, Andrew, I'd love for you to take them in either order. If you were trying to tell a story of Joe Biden's resilient comeback or the story of how Kamala Harris should be the nominee, can you tell either of those stories? Just like a simple like storyboarding, like what would that be about? What's the what are those two stories? With all due respect, there's no story for Joe. There's no way to put that toothpaste back in the tube. He would have to have some Olympian transformation and it would be fraudulent. With Kamala, I think there's a real opportunity to represent her in some way. Probably around an issue, probably around abortion, but she needs to be reintroduced, as you've said several times. And with the right sizzle film, with the right production values, she can be represented as a new choice and that will galvanize half the population. Yeah. In, in your circles and you travel in and you live in New York and you know lots of folks, how are, how are people in your world feeling now? Are they, are they, are they hoping for Kamala or are people saying we need another choice? I'm with my in-laws right now. The, the level of hostility towards her is mind blowing, particularly from people on the right as exemplified by what, what Newt said. But I think there's, are, are you, certain... are your in-laws, are your in-laws Republicans? Yes, extremely. Yeah. So, so anyone who, who's, who's, from the Fox right has a visceral hatred for her, but I think that there, there's a lot of curiosity. Most people don't really know her. She's been characterized as a laughing hyena, but if she, if she has an issue and she's coached properly, she can be put back on message as an avatar for women's rights, for some kind of prosecutorial zeal. She has characteristics that could be represented in a positive way. I wouldn't rule her out as would she be your choice at this point, all things considered, or would you rather see an open process? I'd rather see an open process, but I think that's implausible. Okay. You and I largely agree, as is often the case. Andrew, thank you. I'm going to start sure. calling our folks with their hands up. It's all men right now, and I'd love for some women to be talking here. So actually, before I go the hands up, I'm going to see if Megan uh, is not at the pool and can join us. Megan McCain. Sorry. Megan? <laughs> I Yes, I'm right here. There you go. Megan, Sorry. what do you think? I, um, first, I am just shocked at the level of delusion and defiance among so many Democrats like Joy Reid and Anna Navarro, people who are saying I'd vote for Biden if he were in a coma. The problem that Democrats are presented with is Republicans have had their own issue with having like extreme liar in chief for so long and Trump's lies being, you know, okayed and, and sort of accepted among Republicans. And this is a huge lie. I woke up this morning and, um, I'm, I'm in Arizona with friends. And the big thing we were all talking about at breakfast this morning was the New York post reporting that, uh, the number one leading specialist doctor of Parkinson's spent six hours in the white house with Joe Biden in January. Now, that could be anything. They just signed a bill for Parkinson's, but the conclusion in question was, does he have Parkinson's? And every single move he makes, people are going to question his health. And I, I still believe just from I'm not a doctor, but from what I'm seeing, he's very ill, but there's a lot of Democrats that seem to be okay with losing to Trump um, rather than make any changes and rather like sort of taking responsibility for, um, you know, 
this huge lie and it's been a huge lie. And if they think that they are going to be able to spin their way against the American public uh, in the press or democratic operatives, they're wrong. This is not landing. I mean, with a certain group of people, at, you know, who, who hate Trump so much, they can never see reality. Then, then that's the, then they'll be fine. But I'm just surprised. I think, I think what the speaker said, I'm feeling more and more like this is just, this country is being run by, Jill Biden and Hunter Biden, and they're the last people making the decision. And that honestly, they would rather have like the Bastille burn down and have Trump win than get out of office and admit that that they've been lying. And that to me is a complete, uh, you know, I mean, it's a cataclysmic shift in in how especially young people are going to view politics. And Democrats no longer are going to have the capacity to have any kind of moral high ground on anything. And I just don't understand why you would want to vote for someone in a coma. I, nobody hates Trump more than me, trust me. But I don't understand. And I don't understand how you can say it's okay to have, well, so many wars are going on while we're so vulnerable as a country. Yeah. So I, I that's just been surprising to me to see the amount of yeah. Democrats who are completely defiant. And I was sure he was going to drop out yesterday. And today I'm sure that, you know, maybe Hunter and Jill and the president are going to sit in the White House and let it just burn to the ground. But it's just crazy to me that the president could vomit on himself on live television and there's a group of Democrats that would be okay with it. Megan, two questions for you. Uh, thank you for all that. First of all, um, what did you think of the ABC no, no, no. interview? Meaningless, negative? No, because Grandma Key's got to keep those. Hold on, hold on one second. Let me mute that person. I see it on mute again, Megan. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I thought. Uh, I thought he. I mean, look, it wasn't as bad as the debate, but it wasn't good. The fact that he can't remember if he can, you know, if he can, he had watched his own debate performance or not. He still looks extremely old to me, and. and and infirm and it's just not going to be enough in this what you were talking about with him doing radio interviews where the questions are given in advance like we're really entering like Baghdad Bob North Korea propaganda level I mean I I can't believe they would let him go into interviews where the questions are given in advance like and 22 minutes with George Stephanopoulos and I thought George was fine but 22 minutes with him is not going to be enough but I guess the question just again is if Democrats are okay with having a president who possibly has Parkinson's, who could be in a coma, who could embarrass us and himself on a level that we've never seen in modern times, if they're okay with it, I, I just think that it's ushering in the second Trump era. And I'm just shocked that there are still so many people who are going to have their head in the sand and are, you know, somehow blaming people like me for looking out and speaking the truth. But I will say that, like, Alex Thompson from Axios has been reporting on this for an extremely long time. And uh, from what I was told recently, he actually had a book deal taken away because he was reporting on on this kind of health. And now he's on every network, on every show right now uh, doing his reporting. So I do think the journalists who have like been on this, like Olivia Newsy has this really crazy piece that just came out about her interactions with Biden. Like I do, what's fascinating is that a lot of people in the press seem to be on the side of those of us that think that it's worth knowing if the president has a cognitive disorder. And, you know, you have Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's like America's doctor coming out saying he needs to have a cognitive analysis done. Um, so I do think like they can only like, you know, put so much in the dam for so long. But at this point, I really think they could like wheel him in a wheelchair onto the convention floor and there's going to be a bunch of Democrats that just say it's not Trump. So it's fine. Mm -hmm. Megan, what's wild. the best what's what's the best outcome for you at this point? I mean, this is so bad. Uh, the best outcome. I mean, if I were Democrats, I mean, I'm a gambler. I would roll the dice on Kamala or someone else, because I think like, you know, when you have 70 to 80 percent of the American public, including Democrats, saying his age is a, is a deal breaking issue, I would I would make him step down. You keep making the point that no one can make him step down, which is entirely possible. Um, but and if I were in any way related to the Trump campaign, I would find the most moderate, cozy uh, Republican that is the kind of Republican people like me like and make them their running mate. I would not do a J.D. Vance. I would not do a Vivek Ramaswamy, like no MAGA person. I would do like the speaker said, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a Governor Youngkin, like someone who's just super moderate and very uh, accessible to Republicans like me. I don't know if he'll end up doing that, but there's a lot that if, if Trump can remain even semi-disciplined, there's a lot, a lot to make up. But um, look, this is like a hellscape doomsday scenario for the country. I, 
I've been so upset and it's, you know, it's not just about me, but I think like if I'm upset, a lot of people are upset and I feel like our country is extremely vulnerable to our enemies. If they, you know, seeing that we have this like insane Game of Thrones dying king as our president and we're supposed to pretend like he's not as sick as he is. And you're asking what you're asking the American public to do. And I think this is particularly triggering, triggering for people who have had to take care of ailing parents. It is not my job to monitor the president's health. It's not my job to know whether or not he's going to be okay. But if you're telling me I have to be okay with a president having a nap during the afternoon, who is only functional between 10 in the morning and four or five o'clock in the evening, it is it is an insane ask of the American public. And I honestly can't believe Democrats who are always on the moral high horse, we're always so much better than everybody else. I can not believe that is an ask you're asking Americans, particularly Americans who are living on the poverty line, who are having trouble feeding. Sorry, I think it's putting them at the risk. Thank you. Mayo Fowler, unmute. There you go. go ahead. Oh, hi, Mark. Um, How so are you? Uh, here's some silver linings for Kamala Harris, who I think is going to be the next president of the United States. I think this is a wild, wild election like 1860, and she's a dark horse, which let's say, that's a silver lining because the American public at large do not know her. So let me tell you a few things about her. And Mark, I think you know these things. I lived in I'm California sorry, like, most yep. of my life. Yep. Let me most let me talk, just, inter just, just interrupt it. Ask you to tell people a little bit about yourself, just because so, so they know oh, where you're coming okay. from. Okay. So ahead. I spent all my adult years in California. Actually, I now live in the Berkshires, and I'm actually at this moment in Martha's Vineyard. Um, I wrote about the 2008 election for the Huffington Post, and I'm the person who did the recording that Barack Obama said, uh, you know, rural people in Pennsylvania clung, cling to guns and religion as a way of uh, dealing with life. All right. Go ahead and um, tell people now what, what you think about Kamala Harris that they don't know. So, OK, first of all, you and other people have mentioned, oh, she's on Trump's plane with Willie Brown. I'm guessing 99% of Americans do not know who Willie Brown is. Um, yes, she has a past. Don't want to go into her past, but I think her past is somewhat, um, we don't care anymore about what people's, you know, personal lives sexually have been. I think Clinton and Trump have, you know, inured us to that. So I think she's, she can get past that. And in California, she she shares a characteristic with Obama, an extremely disciplined person who has always been in this for the long game. So in California, when she was the district attorney, she was really tough on crime. Why? I have no idea what her thoughts are or what her beliefs are, because she knew if she were going to go in any national platform, that is who she had to be. In D.C., she might as well have been in the witness protection program for four years because I don't think the American public at large has any idea other than on immigration at the beginning of her time as vice president that she's been doing anything much at all. And so that's the huge silver lining. The other thing is she's running against Trump, terrible candidate. And if she's the candidate, a very short amount of time to let people know who she is third silver lining she would never say this but she really only has to address herself to the people over the age of 50 in the battleground states who are the undecided voters who will swing the election and for them i think and that's my age group she needs to say look i am the first not just that i'm the first african asian american woman possibly to be president the important thing is I am the first of a new generation of younger people coming along. And if you don't like me in four years, there are younger Republicans, certainly true, younger Democrats, get in the scrum, get in the fray and run because, run because it's our time now. And I think it's hard, maybe it seemed counterintuitive, counterintuitive, but I think for older people, for younger people, a new generation coming along is an extremely powerful, positive message. She'll have a short amount of time in order to show she's not AOC, because a lot of older people might think, oh my God, she's so liberal. She's like AOC. She's really not. She's really not. She's an extraordinarily ambitious, focused, um, 
controlled person who wants to go as far as she can and certainly wants to be president. And, and I think help. these yep. factors can get her there. Okay, that's that's a great counterpoint to the, the views other others have expressed. Thank you. Jessica Kraus, can I get you on camera? I would love to ask you a question if you're willing to come on camera and turn on your mic while we wait to see if Jessica chooses to join us. Jason, go ahead and unmute, ask your question or comment, please. May Thanks I again, so thank you. Go ahead. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Mark. So um, I am a moderate Democrat. I really, really appreciated what uh, Mr. Gingrich had to say, but I, I, I disagree with him slightly in that he pointed to the fact that it is the policies that people are against with Biden. Now, well, I certainly agree that the border is an issue for Biden, but if you look at polling, his age is the albatross that is around his neck. I mean, 70 to 80% of the people in America say that he is unfit because of his age Jay, to be Jason, president. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to stop you for saying to say the polling also shows that immigration and inflation are problems too. So right, you're, no, no, I, I yeah. yeah, agreed, yeah, without a doubt, yes, the border is yeah. it was without a doubt an issue. But my my point is, and what I guess what I'm what I'm commenting on is every hedge, every halt, every uh, misspeak is going to be scrutinized over j just so tightly, and I cannot imagine. I don't understand exactly, and I guess my question is. And I'm hoping the people will speak to the president about this that are in his inner circle. How can you ran, run a campaign when that level of scrutiny is going to be on every speech, every campaign stop? I, I just don't know how it's possible to withstand that level of scrutiny that the focus is going to be on not what he says, but how he said it. Yeah, well, Jason, I think you're right. I think it'd be extremely difficult, uh, particularly because he can't perform that well, right? If he If he were great, and he and he's got a lot of scrutiny. He could try to win people back, uh, but you know, as I've said from the beginning of this, since the debate, all the things the Democrats want him to do to prove that he can do this are the exact things he can't do, which is why he wasn't doing them. The press conference on Thursday will be fantastically interesting, and maybe he'll perform great again, assuming he gets to Thursday, which I think he will at this point. Um, but but let me ask you, Jason, if you could pick the Democratic nominee, who would you pick? If I could pick the Democratic nominee, and if it was any, if it was just a uh, Josh they Shapiro, have to be, they have to be constitutional eligible. Josh Shapiro, yeah. Josh and, Shapiro, and, I think, I think, and, I think it'd be fantastic. And what, yeah, and what adjectives would you use to describe your your posture if it's Kamala Harris as your nominee? Um, excited, excited, it, excited that she is young and new and fresh, and I think that she would create a lot of energy to the ticket just because she's new and she is not Trump or Biden. I think that so no, that, no that, doubt, that in itself no doubt, is you're no doubt in your mind, unlike what Speaker Gingrich thinks that she'd be stronger than Joe Biden. No doubt. Yes, without a doubt. OK, thank you, Jason. Uh, let's go to the other Jason who had his hand up, which I didn't notice. We had two Jasons. Very, Jason, very popular Weingarten. name. Go ahead, Jason. Spelled differently. Jason, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I would say, you know, we're a week after the debate. It seems like Biden has not done what he needs to do to reassure the crowd. Jason, are you say, a D or DNR or something else? I'm not party affiliated. I'm here in San Francisco, though, so I guess I you, know, you can guess the water that I swim in. <laughs> okay, but, but um, who? When, if it was going to be, if it's Trump Biden, who will you vote for? The couch. Okay, <laughs> you're a couch man. Okay, go ahead. The couch. Yeah. So I would say Trump has uh, probably done what he needed to do this past week, stay out of it, you know, let the implosion happen and just kind of, you know, be off in the distance. I'm wondering if you think that Kamala has done what she's needed to do in the past week. And then some of the other names on the blue side of the aisle, if they have done what maybe they needed to do in the past week or are setting themselves up for what they need to do to uh, step forward. If the time does come yeah. or when the time does come. I think in the limited things she's done, she's been pitch perfect. People criticize her for one of her tweets, but I think she's been pretty good. And I think everybody, everybody else who might be hopeful has done pretty well. Um, none of them have been critical of the president publicly, but I know that at least some of them have doubts about it. And, and I don't know that any of them are super enthusiastic about it running uh, against Kamala Harris if she's in. But, um, you know, she, she talked to CBS News very briefly. She was at the 4th of July event. She's done some of the events of her own. She's done Q&A that I've gotten not that much attention. They're not on camera. 
but she's handled the questions pretty well. And she, I thought she was great the night of the debate. So if people are looking to see if she's got, you know, she's sort of in the groove here to get ready if she's the nominee, I think she's done pretty well of late. Um, Jason, thank you. Uh, let's go to, um, uh, sorry, Andrew. Tell everybody who you are, Andrew. Hey, Mark. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Scharf, a uh, Republican voter from uh, Palm Beach, Florida. Um, great to be here and uh, really scintillating conversation. My, my question, uh, you know, to you, Mark, and everyone else on the call, you know, we discussed earlier uh, potential pressure from Senator Schumer and Congressman Jeffries, and that's domestic. After seeing this debate, what do our partners around the world feel about this? And is that the next leg of this yeah. report that's really going to cause the dominoes to fall? Because if you really think about it, they've been interacting with what seems to be like a shadow government here. Uh, yeah. And it's it's terrifying to think about. And what? how do you think that part of the story plays out? Yeah. So one of the things I left out my list and, and, and my news summary at the top was a Politico story. Which, which they felt so uh, passionately about that they, they sent out a breaking news alert on it. The headline is, American allies fear Biden is finished and can't beat Trump. We're not sure that even if he wins, he can survive four years more, said one NATO official. I think this week, I, 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 my guess, I'm only guessing, I don't, it's not reporting, that President Biden thinks, well, I'll be at the NATO summit, I'll look presidential, I'll be in my element. If you look at what's happened to European diplomats, it, it it's the it's the exact parallel of what's happened to Democrats, which in the Biden orbit, which is they're willing now to say stuff to reporters that they weren't, weren't willing to say before. So I suspect Republicans will play this card. I know the Trump campaign will eventually play it very hard if Biden's the nominee, the notion that he's not qualified to be commander in chief. And I think you'll see it this week. I think almost certainly in the context of NATO, you'll see blind quotes from diplomats along the lines of what's in this Politico story of people basically almost moving past Biden to say, of course, Biden can't be president. And of course, he's not going to win the election. And we've already seen that in Japan. It's been a, the assumption for a while that Trump was going to win. I think in Europe, if you took a poll of foreign ministers and prime ministers now, I'd be surprised if anybody in that group thought Trump was going to lose. So I think it's it, it's it's another one of the Shakespearean aspects of this, which is Joe Biden, former chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, you know, which spends more time on foreign policy than 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 almost anything else, uh, I think will will be in denial about how brutal this is going to be for him. And again, this is something this is this is kind of of a piece with Republicans saying he can't be president. Obviously, the biggest component of that is national security. So I think it's just going to be a massive issue and uh, and will continue for a while. Alex Castellanos, I'd love for you to say, if you worked for the Trump, thank you, Andrew, if you worked for the Trump campaign, Alex, um, how would you message this in a, in a spot or from the candidate in terms of the national security stuff? I don't think I could do anything better than what Joe Biden is doing to himself right now. The more, the more and you inject politics into this, the less credible you make it. Uh, yeah. Joe Biden is craving to be in a political fight with Donald Trump right now. That would be a good day for him. So I'd leave this alone because we haven't hit bottom yet. Uh, you know, we think this is it, this is historically unprecedented, but it can get worse and it will. Not only his abilities, but the world is a tinderbox. People are going to, predatory nations are going to try to take advantage of this. And on top of that, Joe Biden is going to find himself in a position where it's his political advantage to be the strong man. Irony of ironies. So I think we've got four months ahead of unprecedented danger here. And, and right now, less politics from Trump. I do think he's got to rethink his VP choice. And maybe somebody like the governor of Virginia, because you may have a generational ticket. And I do think that folks who've talked about that are exactly right. Both parties are just starved for generational change. And Trump's a lot of things, but he's not that. 
Alex, um, I don't know that your governor is being vet, has been vetted, so I'm not sure he's in a position to be picked. Uh, right. Who says who says stability and, and the other other characteristics you're talking about best between Bergam Vance and Rubio? <clears throat> probably, probably you would think Bergam, but I would make the argument that it's Rubio because he's been there, because the nation's more familiar yeah. with him, because he's he has been vetted and tested. And if you get a Shapiro on the ticket, say with Kamala Harris, I'm not sure Doug Burgum can stand that much heat uh, posting up to a really strong, fiery Democrat who yeah. could, uh, like Whitmer or Shapiro or like Bashir. Thank you, Alex. Um, Vice President Harris is in New Orleans today at doing some political events at the Essence Festival. And I'll just read you one great piece of color from the pool report, um, or two pieces of color. On the photo line, she signed a poster that said, first, but not the last. And one of the songs playing while she was on the photo line was Control by Janet Jackson. To KCD, unmute, please. Hi, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. I was just going to chime in on the... Um... I'm largely agreeing with most people. I would say I'm an independent. So I would say if I was, I would be pretty torn if it was Kamala and Shapiro versus Trump and Rubio. I would struggle with that choice. I really would. Yeah. Who, who's your choice if it's Trump Biden? I'm sort of. I I hate to say this, but I think I would write in. <laughs> <laughs> Haley, because I just don't think I can support. I would have said Biden before I watched that debate, but after watching that debate, I just don't think I can support a campaign and a party that puts him forward like that. I just, my compassion for him was too great. That really bothered me. Emotionally, that really bothered me. So I think I wouldn't, I think I'd write in. Okay. Anything else? Sorry. Anyone anything else you want to ask or say? No, but I'm enjoying okay. this. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Link Lauren, unmute on camera. Love to know what you think. I feel like Joe Biden is a drunk sorority girl who doesn't know when to leave the party. He's like, I'm not going home. I'm not leaving. I'm not throwing in the <laughs> towel. It's time for him to go home. He's blackout. His friends need to call him an Uber and send him back to Delaware. I think when it comes to Gen Z, and I reach millions of Gen Z people, I read thousands of comments, I work on Gen Z comms, there's no way to really rebrand Biden, and there hasn't been for a long time. I think their best bet to ignite young people would be to put Kamala forward. I've been seeing a lot of Kamala memes, a lot of excitement online around Kamala. When it comes to Trump, I want to see Burgum or Youngkin as VP. What Trump did incredibly well in 2016, I was just talking about this a few days ago on a radio show, he chose someone who was the antithesis of him in the public's eye, right? So Trump was this bombastic New York Post guy. He had The Apprentice. He was a ladies' man. He chose a VP who seemed very stable, very milk toast, very boring with Mike Pence. I think he's going to need a Burgum or a Youngkin to bring those independents who are on the fence, those people who couldn't bring themselves to vote for Trump before, but they say, oh, he's got a Burgum with him or a Youngkin. I don't see Rubio bringing that, to be completely honest. I think Rubio also has a lot of bad clips from years in the past. So that's pretty much how I feel. I also, um, something just as someone who's an independent media like Jessica, a majority of Americans, you can look at any poll, are distrustful of the mainstream media. And this past week has just pushed it over the edge because you've got people like Joe Scarborough and all the, you know, Rachel Maddow, who for years have carried water for Biden. Even months ago, you know, Joe was saying Biden's the sharpest he's ever been. This is the best Biden we've ever had. And clearly they've been lying to us. So I don't think it's possible to rebrand Biden when a majority of Americans are online getting their news and aren't watching the mainstream media anyway. They're going to have to do something to bring excitement and that would be finding someone new. Okay, Link, two things. One is, in terms of Joe, who's my friend, he spent time with Biden, and Biden was fine when he spent time with him. So I don't think Joe was lying. He just didn't see what uh, what what we've seen in public. 
what are the memes, the positive memes about Kamala Harris? What are they based on? Are they based on stuff she said or her biography? What do people like? No, they're all just comedic memes of her laughing, but I don't know if there's someone and just laughing, other funny moments. But are people they saying, oh my God, I, I don't, they're almost in a positive light where young people find her exciting or engaging in a sense. I think Kamala has an ability to reach a lot of Gen Z and millennials if they put her in, but then they're going to lose a lot of other people. And my generation is the least likely to show up to vote anyway. So right. it's just not looking good for the Democrats this time whatsoever. All right, Link, thank you so much. Nancy Glenn, Thanks. unmute, please. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm a, I'm a uh, moderate in Pennsylvania, registered Republican. Um, I have to say, if I would never have voted for Trump before. Always swore I would never vote for Trump. When I left that, that uh, the little bit of that um, debate that I could stand, I almost thought to myself, wow, I, I may have to vote for Trump. Because I've always voted. I just have always voted. I'm not that person that's. Who'd, who'd you vote for in 16 and 20, if you don't mind my asking? I voted for um, Clinton, Hillary yeah. Clinton. I think yeah. she got a bad rep. I think yeah. that, that when all is said and done, she's a very hard worker. Um, and I voted for Biden because I was never going to vote for Trump. It was right. not going to happen. Um, but if it's Trump, I, if, it's, if it ends up being Trump Biden, you might vote for Trump? Wow, I've got to tell you, that is just so painful. I don't think I can. I just don't think I can. I find it interesting that people can vote for Trump be, just because of the person that he is. And you hear, oh, but it's his policies. I love his policies. Okay, well, what are they? And then it's mute. They can't tell you what his policies are if he's got two of them. You know, yes, he yeah. deregulated a lot of things. I'll give him that. But yeah. the damage that he did was, in my opinion, so much greater. But now yeah, they, where we are with with Biden and and what's happening here i don't i don't see that it's even an issue he cannot he can barely be president now yeah. he can't run for president in my Nancy, opinion how do, that's how do you feel about having voted for him three years ago i don't think he was that I, he's no. not the person he was three years ago now okay. and i and think it, that that's yeah. the problem people are saying oh he did such a great job for three years yes he was a different person then because okay. i believe that yeah go ahead, go ahead. There you go. I was I was going to say that I think that both both Biden and Trump did good things as president, and I think that the media and and all of this animosity and anger about everything is is just so divisive and and harmful. Nancy's a moderate Republican. Tell people what they should know about your Democratic governor. You like him? I do like Shapiro. Yeah. Yeah. He steps I up. He steps up when we need it. When we had that that crash on 95, he was there in a heartbeat. He does. I am very pro pro choice. He is also. I'm that I'm that I'm that Republican who is pro choice, um, which is another reason I have a problem with the, the conservative right. But um, I think he's a good man. He shows up. He does. He's he's high, high on education, which I I my degree is in education. I'm a real estate agent, but. Um, I think that's you really think, important. You think he'd beat Donald Trump if he were the nominee? You know, that's a tough one because he's so young and really he doesn't have that much experience. He was our um, attorney general. Yeah. And now he's governor. He really doesn't have a lot of experience. And Nancy, how would you weigh your choice if it's Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump? Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I was very anti Kamala, but I also think that I was following a lot of the the media stream of, you know, she's a laughing hyena, she's this, she's that, and no, no, no. And and since this whole thing happened with Biden, I'm searching for an alternative that I can live with. And now that I'm looking at her closer, um, and I don't mean by any stretch of the imagination in any depth, but I'm starting to look at her with kinder eyes, let's say that. Um, she's so very you might, you, you might vote for her over Trump. I would. I would vote for would. her. Over you Trump, would. absolutely no, no question about that. Nancy, I speak for the group when I say you're as a, as a moderate Republican who might vote for Kamala Harris over Trump. You're the most powerful person on this call. Yeah, because you live in because <laughs> you live in Pennsylvania. Um, well, my, my I'm not all question, that popular here. Where, where do you where do you live in Where do you live in Pennsylvania? I live in Chester County. I'm a western suburb of Philadelphia. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, Nancy, I hope you stay in touch with us and come back and keep us updated on your on your selection. On my we journey. Get <laughs> thank yeah. you. Nancy, thank, thank you. you. Um, 501, so we've gone a little bit over time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody. I had your hands up. Thank you for participating. I'll say again, two-way is a new platform. It's meant for conversations just like this. We call them conversations like no other. I hope you found this to be a little bit more sophisticated than you might see on cable news. I hope you like the diversity of voices. We heard from some Republicans and some Democrats, the length of what we talked about, and I hope you enjoyed listening to people from around the country ask questions and participate. We'll do more of these. I can't promise we'll do them every day, but as long as we're uh, watching to see what happens with Joe Biden, we'll probably do a lot of them. There'll be a, a recorded version of this sent around. You can feel free to share that on social media or with your friends. And if you want to know more about Two Way, you can look on Wide World of News and uh, for the mission statement. You can read more about it there. And we'll have more to say about Two Way in the days ahead as we as we go a little bit more public and do more events like this. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, and we'll see you again soon.